uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, when I first got the invitation from Klaus to attend and be a keynote speaker at this conference, I didn't he hesitate to, uh, to accept the offer. Um, first and foremost because of, um, of the topic of the conference. And I think that the topic, um, the idea to combine and to look at health inequality research and um, research on um, comparative welfare state uh, regimes is a very, it's a very important one. Uh, that was one main reason. My second reason was that I've never been to Berlin before. <laughs> so, um, and I really wanted to see, you know, beautiful Berlin and also historic Berlin. And what I've seen uh, uh, the first um, 24 hours really is promising. So I'm looking forward to see much more of it uh, on the Saturday after the conference. Um, the topic of the conference. Um, I think that um, for quite a long time, the, the research on a comparative uh, welfare state um, um, policies and comparative research on health inequalities have been very separate. Very separate indeed, at least for, for 20 years, I would say. Uh, people who do, uh, who do and have done research on health inequalities have had very, very little um, to do, very little insight, very little information uh, on uh, the huge literature on comparative institutional welfare state research. And vice versa. The people doing research on welfare states, comparative welfare states, have, uh, as far as I can see, very little information, very little knowledge about comparative welfare state research. So uh, I think it's very, very important to try to combine insights from these two uh, fields of academic research. I think there is a room here for cross-fertilization and that uh, both can benefit from, uh, from uh, learning from, from, from the other part. So uh, that's um, one reason and perhaps also the most important reason why this is a very, very important conference. And I also um, think that this conference can bring, you know, the discussion and the knowledge a bit further. Okay. Um, what I would like to do, this is the outline of what I'm going to say. Um, I will um, give a very, very short and brief statement about the current status about uh, comparative uh, research on health inequalities. I will then um, develop some hypotheses uh, uh, which explains or asserts why welfare states uh, features, traits uh, connected to different welfare state regimes should have an impact on population health and health inequalities. Then I will uh, give um, some uh, results from a research project, an international research project that I have been uh, involved in, uh, which includes uh, five uh, countries. Um, and um, and uh, I will give you the, the first and preliminary, this is, this is a project in, in, in progress, so these are the first and preliminary results from, from, uh, from, from the projects. So the, the results are tentative and also the conclusions and implications are, are quite uh, tentative for the moment. So you are one of the first that will hear this, um, uh, these results from, from this uh, project. I will say a little more about it uh, a little later. And finally, I will draw some tentative uh, conclusions and also uh, two or three uh, theoretical implications that can be drawn from uh, the results that we have obtained. Um, there are different, as, as Klaus um, indicated, there are different views on, uh, on, on the current knowledge of what we know about uh, comparative studies, comparative research on, on health inequalities. This quotation is taken from, um, um, from an article uh, by Mackenbach et al. Et al. Et al. that uh, was published uh, last year in New uh, England Journal of Medicine, I think it was. And what uh, this um, really says is that there are no, ev no evidence of small inequalities in health in, country in the countries in Northern Europe. And they um, go on to say that um, the level of social security and public services may be a necessary condition for smaller inequality, inequalities in health, but they are not sufficient. So that's one view on, on the issue. 
but there are other views. These are two quotations taken from a couple of works by um, uh, Ole Lundberg, among others. The first is taken from a book from the News Project. In the, the News Project was a project uh, uh, which was um, headed from Chess Center for Health Equity Studies in Stockholm, um, and they produced a book. And, and the first one is taken. The first quotation is taken from that book. What they say that in terms of absolute levels of mortality among manual workers in Norway and Sweden, they are faring better than in most other, other, other countries, although in relative terms, inequalities in mortality do not uh, differ that much. But in absolute terms, they do differ. That's what they uh, assert. And they go on, uh, the next quotation is taken from uh, a recent paper, uh, I think it was in The Lancet last year, uh, and what they argue here is that, hence, social policies are very important for how we can understand and tackle the social determinants of health. So where um, Wackenbach et al. Uh, say that um, they are, uh, social policies may be um, uh, necessary but not sufficient, they say that um, all the social policies are very important. So uh, there are the differences in opinion as regards uh, interpretation of the data, uh, emphasis on what kind of data um, that are, are out there, and also the implications uh, in terms of social policy. Okay, then uh, let's turn over to what does this regime concept really mean. Uh, it has been mentioned several times. Uh, I would say that um, the, um, the key concept that distinguishes uh, the three welfare state regimes uh, as coined by Justa Esping Anderson in his seminal book, in, <coughs> which was published in 1990, is the concept of the commodification. And basic, basically, this uh, fancy word means that people are entitled to opt out of the labor market when they need to do so, and without uh, reducing their level of living, their living conditions, too much. That's the core of his. That's the core of his uh, of his argument. That's the core of the of the of the concept. So what that really means is that you can divide the, the, the commodification concept in two parts. The first one is universalism versus selectivism, and the other part is the degree of generosity uh, pertaining to different uh, benefits and benefit programs. So along these two dimensions, um, uh, using um, uh, the data which he collected, I, I think it took 10 years for him and his team to collect the data, they end up with the social democratic welfare state regime, which includes Sweden, Norway, um, Finland and Denmark. They will have universal um, benefits programs and you have a relatively generous uh, benefits so people don't lose too much of their living standard when they uh, um, move on to, uh, for example, unemployment benefit. Uh, there we have um, the universal, the universal um, concept in, uh, means also that have social rights, uh, regardless uh, whether you are employed or not employed. In the conservative corporate, corporate, uh, corporatist with respect regime, regime, on the other hand, you also have rights to benefits, and quite generous benefits, but there the rights are connected, they are tied to social status, social class, and or um, social occupations. So that, that, that's, that's different, they are not social rights in the, set, in the, in the same sense as uh, in, uh, in the social democratic welfare states. And then you have the liberal welfare state regime, which basically is um, uh, tar targeted at the disadvantaged, the poor, and the, the benefits are uh, means tested. I think these are the defining characteristics of your studies being Anderson. But in addition to that, there are also some quite salient characteristics that um, uh, distinguish uh, between the regimes. The first in, uh, is, the, I think, that um, there is a commitment to full employment in the social democratic welfare state regime. And the commitment to full employment is not only because uh, it's better for it is better um, uh, living conditions for people who are in employment, but also uh, uh, because that is a, ne a necessity to 
uh, maintain and sustain the whole system. Because we have so uh, we have, I say, uh, the uh, social democratic welfare state regimes, they have so high level of public benefits and public services. So, in order to finance to fu fund those benefits and services, you need a broad tax base, which uh, is only um, uh, you know, possible if you also have uh, full employment. Uh, I mentioned it already. Um, uh, uh, the fact that um, uh, the social democratic welfare state regime also have a very high level of um, uh, public uh, programs, public benefits, is also a very characteristic um, uh, feature of, of, of that regime. Which also means that the people, uh, most people, also the poor people, also the disadvantaged people, have access, because it's paid by the public, have access to care and services as, uh, in the same way as, as, as the richer and, and more uh, advantaged people have. And uh, I think it's also important to stress that at least uh, the aim is that the quality should not differ between um, uh, those who are disadvantaged and those who are advantaged. So there are, there are some defining characteristics, but there also, also are some, some, some other characteristics that distinguish uh, between. And I haven't uh, mentioned yet that also, if you look at, um, as close um, indicated, if you look at several outcomes, for example, income inequality and or um, poverty measures, it's, uh, uh, you see um, very easy that um, the, the, the countries, they cluster into regimes. You have the uh, social democratic, uh, democratic cluster where you have lower income inequalities and lower poverty rates than in uh, the conservative corporatist welfare state regime which is intermediate between the social, democrat, uh, social democratic welfare state and the liberal welfare state, where we have the highest level of income inequalities as measured by the Gini uh, index and also the higher rates uh, of, um, of poverty. But as Klaus also said, the, uh, uh, if you look at income inequalities, the picture is not uh, as clear. So, um, why should um, the social democratic welfare state regime uh, produce better population health and uh, smaller health inequalities than the other two regimes? Uh, I think we can link, uh, develop hypotheses from the distinct, uh, distinctive features of the social democratic welfare state regime. So we can, uh, so, uh, so to say, derive by the use of what we have uh, of the theories explaining health inequalities from the, uh, the main features describing the social democratic welfare state regime. So if we start with the de decommodification, the concept of de decommodification, well, I think one, um, uh, one health promoting uh, aspect of decommodification is, for example, that people do not have uh, to feel that much that they, uh, their living conditions, that uh, their living standard will de 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 deteriorate if they lose their job. That is because uh, people can, uh, can, um, can have quite generous uh, unemployment benefits, for example. So th this should, I think, this uh, ought to create a feeling of control and, uh, and, the, uh, and the feeling of freedom which, according to powerful theories, uh, will enhance health. So the decommodification uh, trade in itself should cause better health, especially among the more disadvantaged. And then we have the uh, universalism uh, criterion, the social rights criterion. I think uh, one of the main features here, here, here is that also disadvantaged people um, are included, are integrated in the social fabric of the society, and also, uh, presumably, in the labor market. And social integration, social cohesion, uh, social support, um, gives better health. And since also um, more vulnerable people, more disadvantaged people, are included in the society, that uh, should also enhance those, people, uh, those people's health. Um, you are familiar with the, with the concept of social capital. And if you look at how social capital are distributed between countries, 
uh, you will see that um, uh, software capital that is you know includes uh, membership in uh, uh, in, in, in among many theorists argue that it includes uh, a spiritual part and uh, uh, attitudinal part. The spiritual part is uh, um, being um, having uh, participating participating in uh, um, voluntary organizations. And the attitudinal part is that uh, people have trust in this, in this other, virtual trust, uh, trust between people uh, in the society. And if you look at, uh, especially at trust, you will see that the four Nordic countries have the highest levels of trust in the world. And they have uh, uh, investigated uh, 150 countries or so. So the tr trust is very, very common, very broad in the, in the Nordic countries. And trust um, will presumably also um, benefit health and reduce health and inequalities. So uh, the decommodification in itself, universalism in, this, in itself, should produce better health. Then we have the generosity of, uh, of uh, public benefits. Well, the most um, immediate and direct effect of that is that um, poverty is um, only concentrated among pockets uh, out in the society. And, uh, and the poverty rates uh, are, as I said, quite low in, in the Nordic countries. And also in the inequality, not only poverty, but also inequality is, is lower. And uh, as you will know, that in the inequality, and as, as Claude said already, inequality is related to, 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 um, to lower health status, and poverty definitely is uh, related to, to poor health. Uh, and if you reduce those um, social features, you will also um, have a better chance to, to increase uh, the health benefit. Uh, the fourth uh, trait, I would say, is that public benefits and services um, perhaps not guarantee, but at least they give e more equal access to these uh, important resources in the social democratic welfare state than uh, perhaps especially in, uh, in the liberal welfare states. And that, uh, that in itself may uh, enhance health. And uh, the fifth and the final um, hypothesis that could be um, developed here is that the welfare state's institutions, they follow you, so to speak, from the cradle to the grave. So they are, uh, presumably, they would um, um, make transitions from uh, different life, life phases um, more smooth than in other welfare states. We have, uh, in the Nordic welfare states, we have a paternal leave, which is, should make it more easy to, to become a parent. We have free and uh, and uh, and or very um, uh, uh, costless uh, education, mostly. Um, we have uh, a lot of labor market programs, uh, rehabilitation programs, both uh, vocational rehabilitation programs, medical rehabilitation programs, which should smooth out um, the transition from being outside the labor market to uh, come inside uh, in the labor market. So for all these uh, reasons, I think that there are uh, good arguments that support uh, the uh, contention that uh, um, uh, the, the social democratic welfare states uh, promotes health and should reduce health inequalities. Uh, I would like to draw attention to three dimensions of health. Because I think that uh, the hypotheses I have um, presented to you now, they are mostly related to two aspects of health, disease and illness. I think that I found this um, distinction, uh, the, the IS triad, it was, I think it was, uh, at least I, I, I read about it uh, by an author called um, uh, Twaddle. Well, many years ago, but I found it very useful, and especially in this context. Um, I think the hypothesis I just um, told you about, they are related to disease and illness, uh, basically, but not that much to sickness. So if we are interested in sickness, we, have, uh, we, we should, we should uh, uh, perhaps develop other hypotheses. The, the disease and illness and sickness dimension um, can be distinguished by each of them by three um, criteria, criteria. The first is um, at what level of reality they address. The second is how you obtain information of that aspect of um, health. 
And the third is um, typical indicators uh, that uh, can be used to measure um, that uh, typic, um, particular dimension of, uh, of health. So I think that uh, we have already quite a lot of um, studies, comparative studies, looking at the, the, the disease uh, dimension and the illness dimension. But you have very uh, much fewer studies looking at the sickness dimension. And that's what I will, uh, and, and, what, what, uh, uh, and as, uh, as Klaus said, you know, uh, there are um, not very convincing evidence that neither the disease dimension or the illness dimension are e more equally distributed in the social democratic welfare states than in other types of welfare states. But I think very few have looked at the sickness dimension, which is uh, the social consequences, a part of the social consequences of having an illness or having a disease. So the project, I will tell you a little bit about now, is on the sickness dimension. There are quite a lot of um, questions that we address in this project, but here I will address only three of them. The first question is that are there differences across countries in the employment differ differentials between healthy and chronically ill? Yeah, should be ill here. Does gender and education modify the association between illness and employment? That is basically a question of inequality, health inequality, because it addresses how education and illness interact with respect to uh, being employed or not. And the last one, do countries differ in terms of how gender and education exerts this modifying effect? That introduces the, the country effect into the interaction between education and uh, illness. I will also uh, touch upon what kind of uh, policy implications that can be drawn. And I, as I indicated, um, I think um, the hypothesis I, I just developed, uh, developed here, you know, they are mostly relevant for the illness aspect and the disease aspect. They are not that, um, may not be that relevant for the sickness aspect. And the reason why is that the sickness aspect, aspect has to do with the uh, capacity to perform or fulfill social roles. And in this um, particular instance, it is the role as a worker. And the role as a worker may not only uh, vary according to um, characteristics of the disease or the illness, but also according to the demands, requirements, um, and the expectations that are directed to the work role you have. And that might vary between countries, and also, of course, within countries and between uh, occupations. So when, when that part of it, that part of the equation becomes so important, I think you should have specific hypothesis, hypothesis related to that aspect. It is both, both the, 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 the capacity to, to, to perform a workload role and also the expectations and demands that are attached to that, that workload that, 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 uh, that are crucial, the, the balance between those two. Um, I think there are at least three hypotheses that could be formulated um, uh, that might predict how welfare states, different social policies may impact on inequalities in sickness. And the first is that, uh, quite straightforward actually, that active labor market policies um, may enhance people with work ability to participate in the labor market. And that might be particularly beneficial for disadvantaged group, groups, for example, people with low education. Then we have um, uh, an, an hypothesis um, um, derived from the decommodification. And when you have um, relative, in countries where you have relative generous benefits and you have a universal coverage, then people do not have to work that much in order to, to, uh, to, to have a decent um, uh, living standard. So in that case, you could perhaps expect that uh, uh, countries where we have a high level of decommodification, people with, with illness and people with low education would rather stay outside of the labor market rather than participate. 
I agree that this, this is more or less a hypothesis derived from neoliberal theory, but still there have been pow powerful uh, notions uh, in this respect. And then we have the flexible or deregulated labor market uh, hypothesis, which uh, say that low uh, employment protection will make it easier for individuals with reduced, reduced workability to get employment and work experience, which also is derived from the same um, way of thinking. That is one um, argument why uh, deregu deregulated labor markets are beneficial for low-status uh, groups. So I, I will not say that our data, our, our data can um, test this hypothesis. Uh, I will, will, will not uh, say that, that strongly, but certainly they will shed some light on these hypotheses. Okay, uh, the progress is called helping chronically ill or disabled people into work. What can we learn from international comparative analysis? And here we see the, the, the five uh, teams that are working uh, all together. I think it's 17 researchers um, from UK, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Canada. Five countries. And as we observe, there are no representatives for uh, the conservative corporatist regime here. There are only three um, um, examples of the um, social democratic regime and two examples from the liberal regime, that is uh, Canada and, and the UK. So we are only able to compare um, the liberal regime with the social democratic regime. And I should say that um, the leaders of this pack is Margaret Whitehead, Whitehead from, from Liverpool. Okay, here are the data. Um, you might see here, it's, it's not very important you know, to go, go into this, but it, I will only show that in Canada there are one point, almost 1.5 million people. It's a micro census, it's a, it's a sample from the census that are used in this project. And those data are from 2001, and the other data are from 2005. Uh, and the age span in all countries is between 25 and 59, uh, the prime age of, of, uh, of, of working, working age. And we'll also see that especially the, uh, the, the surveys, the data from, uh, from Norway, Sweden and Denmark, no, uh, yes, Norway, Sweden and Denmark, uh, the sample sizes are quite low, which means that uh, the analysis has quite low power when we um, uh, break uh, the analysis, ana analysis down on smaller groups. Uh, and. Um, it has been a problem to compare all the questions. They are not identical, but as we argue, I think, and we argue, and I argue, they are similar enough to be compared. Okay, so what, we, what, what should we, should we uh, expect here, actually? Uh, we can skip this one. Uh, here we have employment protection legislation. These are taken from OECD data and, uh, and the paper by Ho et al. from 2006. So what we have here is the, the, um, a measure of the deregulation regulation of the labor market. Here we have the de, uh, direct uh, measure of the decommodification index. And here we are, have uh, spending on the active labor market policy, which are related to all the three hypotheses that I mentioned to you. And if we look at the Employment um, Protection Legislation Index, you can see that um, uh, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden have quite high levels. They have quite high levels of employment protection. That means low levels of the de regulation of the labor market. While, uh, whereas Canada and the UK have low levels. Uh, you can see that Denmark has a quite, uh, a quite lower than uh, Nor both Norway and Sweden which uh, uh, have identical levels, uh, and that is, you know, an illustration of um, the Denmark's uh, famous, I think I've heard about, uh, flexicurity system. They have a, a deregulated labor market, but they have a very good safety net. Uh, that is, the employment benefits are quite generous. So people can switch uh, jobs in the labor market without fear of uh, being poor. The decommodification index indicates the same, actually. High levels of decommodification in the, in the social democratic countries, low, much lower levels in the um, liberal countries. And then we have the active labor market policy. Um, high levels in Denmark and Sweden, 
medium uh, level in Norway and much lower levels in UK and Canada. Uh, it might be surprising that the level is so low in Norway, but uh, at that time in 2004, there were hardly no, uh, the, the unemployment level was very low that year. And since labor market, um, active labor market policy are counter cyclical, it means that at that time there, um, there were not much spending on active labor market policy. It was no need to spend that on that purpose. Okay, which means that we basically we have uh, two clusters for each of these dimensions. Uh, the social democratic tend to cluster together on all uh, unemployment protection, legal education, and active labor market policies. And the Canada and the UK, as expected from um, the, the notion of a liberal uh, regime, uh, uh, are also clustered together. Okay, so what do we find in our analysis of um, employment among men and women, um, healthy and unhealthy. This is a more descriptive table showing that uh, the first and simplest um, findings. Um, if you look at healthy men, we see that uh, the differences in labor uh, market participation are practically non-existent. Healthy women, there are larger differentials between the countries. But if you look at um, men with limiting illness, we see that there are quite substantial differences, as well as that the level is much lower. So the level, um, the employment level among men with limiting uh, illness is much lower than among healthy men uh, in all countries. In all countries, you compare like this. But that the lowest level is in the UK. <coughs> and it's the, if you look at the, uh, in, the, in the brackets, there, there, there you find the confidence intervals. If you look at the brackets, you will see that some are overlapping. But it's quite clear that uh, UK is uh, the level among uh, men with limited illness is quite much lower uh, and significantly lower than in most of the other countries. If you look at um, women with limiting illness, you see that the, the general level here is lower than the male with limiting illness. Uh, and the differences are also quite substantial. And then again, especially between UK and the other countries. So to sum up the main, the key message from this table, employment among men and women with limiting illness are consistently lower than among healthy men and women in all five countries. That's a general trait in, those, uh, in all these five countries. And there are lots of big differences across countries in employment among healthy men and women. Men and women. But UK have lower employment among both men, both men and women with limiting illness. So the UK in this um, descriptive analysis stands out. And now to a more formal test here. Um, what we really are interested in is uh, the interaction between uh, education and uh, long-standing illness. So what we see here is the inter interaction effect between illness and education. And you can see that there is an interaction effect for all the countries and for both men and women. And what that basically means is that um, it's less likely for a person that has low education and illness to be unemployed or non-employed actually, to be outside the labor market, than for a person with high education. That is what it, that, that is what the interaction effect means. And what you see here is that um, the same goes uh, for women. But if you look at the if, if you look at um, uh, the confidence intervals, uh, we can't really say that uh, the United Kingdom differs substantially from the other, and statistically dif um, uh, are, are statistically different from, from the other from the other countries. So I think what we quite safely 
can say um, based on this analysis is that um, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the likelihood of being outside the labour market if you have an illness is larger in the UK than in the other countries. That is, uh, I think, uh, uh, that that um, that conclusion, that result is, is is quite clear. But you can say that the interaction effect, uh, at least with a certain uh, usual level of certainty, you can say that the interaction effect between education and um, illness is larger in UK than in the other countries. And then what about uh, the hypothesis? I think what we can say that um, the active labour market um, hypothesis is at least not rejected since, the, uh, uh, since uh, Sweden, Norway and Denmark have high employment rates among unhealthy. But uh, it, it, it's not completely supported either since uh, Canada also has high employment rates. And uh, we can definitely uh, not say that the decommodification de hypothesis is supported since Norway, Denmark and Sweden have high, have high participation rates uh, among um, the, um, the, the, the ill people. And neither can we say that the Positive, that there is an positive effect of the unregulated flexible labour market hypothesis. It's not supported. If so, we should expect that especially UK will have high uh, rates of unemployment among uh, people with uh, limited illness, and they don't. So, very carefully, very tentatively, these are um, the, the, um, uh, the conclusions so far. And what I will end with is that um, what does this uh, tell us about um, a few things? The first is that sickness dimension. There might, this data doesn't show it very clearly, but there might be a different, uh, sickness might be differently related to um, uh, health inequalities, inequalities in different welfare state regimes than the other um, dimensions, illness and disease. I, at least I'm posing the question that that is a possibility. Um, and that also posed the question whether the social democratic welfare state regime may perform better than the liberal with respect to inequality in sickness. Since you have these consistently higher um, interaction terms in UK than uh, in the social democratic. But because there are also differences within the liberal regime between UK and Canada, I also will raise the question whether the welfare state regime typology fits the comparative data on health inequalities. And I think that was also what Klaus um, um, talked about in his uh, talk earlier today. That how, 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 how well uh, do, do the regime typology, the Jesperson Anderson's typology, fit uh, the comparative data on the health inequalities. And I think they don't, in this respect, they don't fit very well. There are differences between, but also within the regimes, especially between UK and, uh, and, and Canada. There are, there are absolutely differences between those. And Canada is closer to the, to the, the social democratic uh, countries uh, than it is to um, UK. And there also are differences between um, um, within um, the Nordic group. And if you look at other uh, health, um, health measures, health dimensions, mortality, for example, you will observe the same. You will observe that, uh, you will, you will observe that um, Norway and uh, Den uh, Sweden are quite close together. Denmark and especially Finland uh, is far out, actually. So I think uh, we, we need to, as Klaus said, to refine this uh, uh, typology uh, thinking and maybe um, um, invent something, something better. And I also think that yes, I think Anderson never intended that his typology should apply to health inequalities. His typology was meant to, um, meant to, um, to describe social policies and especially policies that aim to redistribute uh, money between people and between generations 
and between the different life phases. And health inequalities are something very, very different, very, very different than, than uh, to, 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 to redistribute health is a different matter than redistribute money, definitely. Thank you very much for your attention.